trick, surely. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here this morning. I know I'm a little bit over this way, so y'all feel free if you want to move over this way. We can see the board better. You can you can do that. Um, um, I'm thankful for those of you who are watching online as well. I think I have maybe two two people at least that are watching every week. We're, I'm happy to have you, whether you're here in person with us or online. My name is Shirley Haugen, and uh, we are in the study of the book of Genesis. This is our 10th lesson in the book of Genesis today. Um, today we're going to be in chapters 12 and 13, and we're talking about Abraham. Um, and so I thought it would be fun before we get into the study of Abraham, just to give you a little bit of background information on Abraham. And so um, Abraham, as you know, he is the patriarch of three major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later um, as we learn more about Abraham. Abraham is known as the father of faith, and he really is the father of faith for, for those three major world religions. Um, in Galatians 3, 6 through 7, it says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So long before Jesus was even born, Abraham became a child of God because of his faith and belief in God. Um, and so Abraham, by the way, he was in the 10th generation from Noah after the flood. So 10 generations later from Noah to Abraham. Um, and, you know, if you remember, Noah would have still been alive when Abraham was alive because like Noah lived to be right? 950 years okay. old. So it's hard to imagine that Abraham, who is 10 generations behind Noah, that, that Noah is still alive during at least part of Abraham's lifetime. That's, I know, that's weird. <laughs> People back then lived a long time. Um, Abraham, by the way, he was a descendant of Shem, which was one of Noah's sons. And, of course, Shem had been with Noah with his wife on the ark. Um, Abraham was 57 years old when Noah died. So for 57 years, Noah, Shem, and Abraham were all alive on this earth at the same time. Isn't that unbelievable? I, I don't think I, I realized that. Um, so, in fact, Shem outlived Abraham, who was like nine generations behind him. <laughs> so, the way people live such long lives, kind of, it's, we have to remember that because sometimes the numbers and the years don't make sense until you realize how long people lived. Um, and so, Abraham, he could have received firsthand accounts of creation. Think about this, because Noah knew Methuselah <coughs> before the flood, right? And many of the other early patriarchs um, who knew Adam. So think about that. They could have really heard those accounts and stories of creation and what happened in the garden with the serpent and how they were. They would have heard, those stories would have been passed down and they could have heard it, you know, um, relatively firsthand, so to speak. So those stories would have been passed down to Abraham. Jewish tradition states that Noah was 940 years old when the Tower of Babel story took place. And we talked about how he lived about 950 years. And there were about 340 years between Noah and, or excuse me, yeah, between Noah and his family when they left the Ark and the Tower of Babel. We talked about that Tower of Babel last week. And so if you figure up all the life years given in the Bible, then Abraham would have been 47 years old at the time of the story of the Tower of Babel that we talked about last week. Abraham lived to be 175 years old. We know that from Genesis 25. Abraham is 75 years old as we begin our story today in chapter 12. So he's about 75 years old, and it's been about 28 years or so since God confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. Um, and so I wanted to kind of go into a little bit of Abraham's family tree. Father Abraham, right? <laughs> And really, when we say Father Abraham, it really is more like Father Terah, because we it all starts with Abraham's father. Now, Abraham's father, he worshipped some gods. He he got a little sidetracked. So Abraham's father Terah was not necessarily a man who walked with God, but Abraham was. And Terah had three sons. Um, he had Haran, Nahor, and Abram, who later becomes Abraham. Um, and that's their family tree. Now, we know if you read in Genesis 11, we know 
from Genesis 11, verses 27 through 32, that when Abraham and Terah still lived in Ur, that his brother Haran died. I don't know if it's Haran, Haran. Haran died, he passed away. And he left at least three children. He left his son Lot and his two daughters. You notice I have the girls circled in a heart. <laughs> Iscah and Milcah were left behind when Haran died. Now, the family trees are kind of weird back then because <coughs> there was a lot of intermarrying within the families. And that was normal back then because that was, that was how the population grew when there weren't as many people on the earth. So after Haran died, it's interesting that Abraham kind of took his nephew Lot in. It's almost like he adopted him in a way since his father was dead. And you'll notice that Milcah, one of the, his nieces whose father had passed away, she ended up marrying his brother Nahor. So Milcah was taken care of, right? Lot was taken care of because he's now with Abraham. And Milcah married Abram's brother. But what about poor Iscah? What happened to her? We know she exists because that Genesis 11 tells us about her. But it doesn't tell us what happened to her. Did they just forget about her? What happened to poor Iscah? So I had to do some research. Did you know that it's commonly accepted and rabbinical scholars tend to agree on this point that Iscah is probably one and the same as Sarah. Mm. Did y'all know that? Mm -mm. Most Jews accept it as just the way it was. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. That's been passed down through the, the Jewish history, right? But the Bible, the Torah, doesn't really tell us that. Um, so I'm going to put this little jacket on there. Now, there is another verse in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 20, when Abraham is telling the Pharaoh why he lied about Sarah being his sister oh, instead of his wife. He said, but she really is my sister. She, he, meant, he said that she's my sister, but with another mother. So Abraham says that she's his half-sister. So that verse indicates that Sarah is, in fact, a child of Terah. But the Jewish, wrong, right? the Jewish tradition and rabbis hold that, well, she was like a sister, mm -hmm. like a half-sister, but really, she is his niece. his niece. So, I don't know. She's either a half-sister or a niece, and if she's a niece, she is one and the same person. And like I said, if you read articles from Jewish scholars, they'll tell you Iscah is Sarah. Um, and in fact, Iscah, the name Iscah means princess. And Sarah means my princess. So Jewish tradition holds that they are one and the same. That Abraham's wife, Sarah, is in fact his niece, Iscah. The one that looks like she just got left out. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, that's just an interesting background. Um, I will say this. Um, this may give us some insight into why God chose Abraham. Listen to this article. It is noted that the people of the Tower of Babel even wanted to make a name for themselves. They built cities in that day to make a name for themselves. And this goes back to Cain, the first murderer, he, he was the first recorded to build a city and name it after his son. He wanted to make a name for himself. Abram, Abram, on the other hand, was more interested in preserving the name of his dead brother, Haran. He wanted to take care of the children of his dead brother. Um, that is why we are the family of Abraham. Abraham was all about preserving his family. It's interesting that Abraham seemed to practice a form of the Leverite law, which stated that if a man died not having heirs, that the kinsman redeemer, his brother or nearest kin, was to take the widow and bring children to his dead brother. Abraham seemed to understand this concept before it was even written or recorded in the Torah. So Cain, remember, Cain asked 
when God said, hey, what happened to your brother that he had just killed? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> to have Cain, who could have cared less about his brother, he wasn't in, interested in anyone but himself. Neither was Nimrod or any of the others, but Abram was. Abram not only worshipped one God, contrary to the culture at that time, but he also understood the concept of right relation, right relationships with fellow human beings, and especially the continuity of family. He was not interested in building a name for himself, but in prolonging the name of his dead brother. So why is Abraham so important? He was the one who cared for the family. He made sure that Milcah got taken care of by his other brother. He took Lot in, almost like his own son, and it looks like he might have married his God, if she is, in fact, also Sarah. So it says that Abraham was the one who taught the family the ways of God. Genesis 18, 18 through 19 says this, and this is, God said this about Abraham. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So I think that when you really look at what was happening, Abraham had the favor of God because Abraham cared about his family. He cared about that more than having a name for himself. So last week we talked about the Tower of Babel and we had a story where man's plan was playing out instead of God's plan. Man's plan, of course, is to make a name for himself. Um, it said they wanted to make a name for ourselves by building a great city and a great tower to the heavens. But God's plan was for man to disperse so they would multiply and fill the earth. Man's plan was to build a tower to the heavens, but God's plan was to bring forth his plan of redemption where a future Messiah, Jesus, would provide a way for mankind to get to heaven. Man's plan was to journey further east away from God but God's plan was for man to journey west closer to God. In Genesis chapter 12, God begins to set his stage for his plan, his plan of redemption. And it all starts really with Abraham and Sarah. That's where it all begins. Um, why don't you read for us Genesis chapter 12, just verses 1 through 5. Oh, we do. <clears throat> Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in, and in, all, and, and in, in you all the families of the earth will be, for, will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with, Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Thank you, Dave. Sure. Um, I want to go back to the family tree for just one moment, but one of the things I read, by the way, by some of this Jewish history um, is that the reason this could have happened, because we know that Sarah was, was about 10 years younger than Abraham. And most of the Jewish accounts believe that Haran was the older brother and that he was probably over 100 years older than Abraham. So anyway, it helps to know that little bit of information for this stuff to make sense, for this family tree to make any sense. So, um, and notice how right here at the beginning of Genesis 12, God starts off telling Abraham all kinds of things that he's promising to do. He says, I will show you this land. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless you. I will. So this is in contrast to the people during the Tower of Babel who said, let us make bricks. Let us build a city and a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. 
So God is saying, I will show you the land I want you to go to. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Um, and so the difference between Abraham and the people around the time of the Tower of Babel is that when God spoke, Abraham obeyed. Um, that's what he did. God said, go from your country, and Abraham went. Verse 4 even says, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran, and that means Sarah would have been about 65. So by the way, like I said, Sarah was 10 years younger than Abraham, and back then they lived longer. So Abraham and Sarah, they were like 65 and 75, which by today's standards is old, too old to have children. But back then, that would have been more like maybe middle-aged, maybe less than middle-aged, because they lived so much longer. Um, and so when God said, go, Abraham, he went, and they, they did go to the land of Canaan. Now, our focal verses for today kind of skip over a lot of the journey. And so I wanted to point out some of the things that we skipped over because even though Abraham had faith and belief in God, he did have his ups and downs. <laughs> Abraham wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. He had his ups and downs in his faith walk with the Lord, just like we do. Um, and so along Abraham's physical journey, as he traveled to to the land that God had called him to, he was really also on a faith journey as well. Um, and so along the way, they journeyed to Egypt to escape a bad famine. And y'all know the story that happened there because Sarah was so beautiful, Abraham was afraid that the people were gonna kill him to take his wife. And so he told Sarah to tell everybody that, that she was his sister. And, and, he, and she did that. And of course, we know what happened, the Pharaoh, saw her and wanted her for himself, and he did, in fact, take her to be his wife, which is unbelievable, right? But that's what happened. And because of that, Abraham was enriched because as the brother of Sarah who had married the Pharaoh, he got blessed with all this sheep and cattle and donkeys and lots and lots of servants uh, because he was her brother. So he was enriched and he was not killed. Um, of course, we know that later God afflicts Pharaoh because of what he has done. And he's taken Sarah from Abraham. And when Pharaoh figures out the truth, he kicks Abraham and Sarah out of Egypt. And that's when Abraham told Pharaoh, well, she's my wife, but she really is my half-sister. So he did know that she was a relative, whether she was a half-sister with his father or she was a niece through his brother, she was like a sister to him as well as his wife. You can't make this stuff up, you guys. I love the Bible. These are This is good, interesting stories going on in here. So that's what was going on. Um, so the question is, where was Abraham's faith and trust during the famine? <laughs> it was like, even though God had made all these promises to Abraham, you, you would think that Knowing that, he would trust God to keep him alive and to provide food for him and to keep people from killing him to take his wife. But even the father of the faith sometimes faltered in his faith, just like we do. Um, Abraham even had quarrels with his nephew Lot. We know that when they re when uh, Abraham and Lot, they got kicked out of Egypt and they returned to Canaan, that, that there was a lot of quarreling going on because they had so many animals. And Lot's herdsmen were quarreling with Abram's herdsmen about where they should graze and be because they just had so many, they didn't know how to manage them. And Abraham decided that they shouldn't be quarreling anymore, that he shouldn't be quarreling with his, with his nephew. So they decided to separate so that they wouldn't quarrel anymore. Genesis 13, 10 through 12 says this, Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zor was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now we talked last week about how when people move east, that tends to be 
significant theologically. That usually means they're moving away from God. And when they move west, that usually means they're moving toward God. So when Lot chooses to move east, we're getting a little foreshadowing here that maybe some things are not going to go so well for Lot. Um, Dave, would you read for us Genesis 13, verses 13 through 18? Sure. <clears throat> Now the men of Sodom were wicked and exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, and I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came by that came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Thank you, Dave. Sure. So right there in verse 15, it says, All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. So God gave Abraham and his descendants this land to live in forever. And God told Abraham to go and walk his land, and he did. He did. And God told Abraham to go to a strange new land, and he went. And God made these promises, and Abraham trusted and obeyed. And then it says, he says he, here we go with the tents and altars. It says, he pitched his tent and built an altar. You got here just in time for that, Ben. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this reminds me, of course, when Noah built his altar right after the flood, when they got off the ark. Um, that's what he did. So Hebrews 11.8 says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, <clears throat> obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God, the new Jerusalem from Revelation 21. So when you think about what Abraham did, he, he spent all this time traveling. By the way, the journey was very long. I love that our study guide has a map in the very back of it. And I know it's probably hard for y'all to see, but there's a map in there. And so if you look at where Ur is, where they started back when he was still with his father, when his father was still alive, they had to travel up. They couldn't go directly across because there were mountains in between. So they go up all the way to Haran, where they stayed for a while, until <coughs> Terah died. And then after Terah died, then they made their way back down to Canaan. And this was over a thousand mile journey. And they didn't have cars or trains or planes. They were walking with all of their worldly possessions and all their family members and their animals and servants and everything. And they were living in tents. They were nomadic. You know, we t you asked that question before. Did God intend for us to be nomads? Apparently, he intended for Abraham and his family to be nomads for this period of time. And they were. And so, while we know... His brother stayed back in Ur, and by the way, his brother and his wife Milka, they were not close to God. They were known to worship other gods. Um, and Lot, we know he goes, he goes the wrong direction, <laughs> and he has some problems along the way. But Abram goes east toward God. Or west toward God. Right? Oh, excuse me, yeah. west toward God. Thank you for correcting me. i got to get the direction straight. And you don't hear him complaining. You don't hear of Sarah complaining. Where, was there complaining going on, you think, along the trip? I'm sure there was. <laughs> They're human. They're humans. I'm sure they were complaining when they'd have to put up the tent, take down the tent. All that sand blowing around in the wind. Mm -hmm. And some places they were traveling through were beautiful, but some places maybe not so beautiful, right? Just like when you take a road trip, sometimes the scenery is amazing and sometimes it's West Texas and kind of boring, sorry. <laughs> you tell them from East I'm Texas. Not, not Actually, East there East. are some beautiful parts of West Texas, too. I'm uh, farther east than you. Yeah, that's true. That is true. But you don't hear them complaining. And Abraham's faith is so great. And I think the reason you don't hear a lot of complaining, at least in the Bible, 
it, it's not because people probably, there, I'm sure there were people complaining, but I'm sure Abraham, as the leader of his clan as they traveled, he kept their attitude positive, that they were obeying God and they were doing what God had asked them to do. So any rumbling and grumbling and complaining that might have been going on, I think was held to a minimum because of Abram's great faith. And that, you know, the lead, the faith of the leader, I think, was carrying down to the other family members and the servants and the people that were traveling along with them. And so they, they go and they do this. And they're, they're living a very difficult lifestyle. You know how hard it is to, like, set up camp and cook and prepare a meal and... How do you wash your clothes and your dishes? And there's a lot of inconvenience and a lot of hard work that was involved in moving this massive family clan all the way from Ur up to Haran and then ultimately back down to Canaan. And so it, it really did. Abraham, I think because he believed in the promises of God and he did look forward to that city with foundations and Y'all, we don't always see these, like, we know we're not going to see that city with foundations until after Jesus comes. And so sometimes we don't always see what's coming. But we as believers should know, we know how the story ends. So that was Abraham. He knew how the story end, ended. He knew that God was going to make good on his promises so he could put up with all that inconvenience of what, what he and his family were having to do. Um, and there is always a path of faith that leads us home. We talk about the path eastward leads us away from God. And that's the path where we're depending on ourselves or on the people around us. Uh, but there's a path westward that leads back to God. And that is a path where we rely and depend on God. And that's the path of faith. Faith is, is God's plan for the journey. Romans 4 verses 20 through 21 say this about Abraham. It says, Yet he, Abraham, did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. So today, our path of faith that leads us home is through Jesus. John three sixteen. we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Again, it comes back to, for Abraham to be considered righteous by God, it was through his faith. The way we become right with God is through our faith in Jesus, our belief, like it says in John 3, 16. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not from us. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't build a tower to heaven. We have to believe in the way to heaven that God provided, and that way to heaven is Jesus. So the ultimate destination of our faith is love. Galatians 5, 6 says this. It says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. When you look at why God chose <laughs> Abraham, it was, I think, and a lot of commentators agree that it was because he did show such great love for his family and for the people that God had put him in charge of. It, it all comes down to love. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, this is Jesus saying this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if our faith is real, it's going to show up through our love toward others, whether it's our family or the other people that God puts around us in our lives. Any other comments? I'm actually, I'm going to finish early today. Any other thoughts and comments on this? Well, I want you guys to know that I just absolutely adore you all. <laughs> He's showing his love yeah, for I us, did. which is good. Yeah. I, did you hear that, big guy? <laughs> <laughs> so if y'all are okay with it, I will close this in a prayer. Again. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for the lessons you teach us through Abraham. And just like Abraham, sometimes our faith falters and we take a detour off the path of faith that you want us to be on. But we thank you, God, for your grace and forgiveness that we have in your son, Jesus. 
And we thank you that you always find a way to guide us back onto that, that path of faith towards you. Just like Abraham, we always can get back on track and go in the right direction towards you and where you want us to be. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.